Hello everyone, welcome to Interpreting Tradition. I'm going to continue um, with this interview that I have been covering for you, um, given by the Pope uh, in Spanish to an Argentinian um, organization. It's called the Perfil Group and the interviewer is Jorge Fontevecchia, who is the president of this Perfil Group. And um, I'm going to, you know the reasons by now, this under the playlists is under chats, I believe. But anyway, you will see the Pope and I, I had to give it a title, number one, number two, number three. And we are going to cover today um, in the interview, which I will put under uh, below, yes, is uh, from minute 22nd, more or less to minute 38. And they're going to cover uh, quite a few issues. I must say, say that the interviewer is, is, is very good. Um, he, he focuses on things and if the Pope goes off a little bit, he brings him back. Anyway, um, from minute 22, the question the interviewer asks, um, is it the same thing um, regarding civil unions of the same sex? They're continuing with the previous conversation about marriage and so on. So he's asking about civil unions. The Pope says, in Argentina, we had discussed this issue of people of the same sex. Um, the Ep Episcopal Conference had a great debate about it. I, on that point, uh, with another large group and large number of bishops, we proposed that it didn't have to be a marriage, that why do they not uh, enter into uh, civil unions? This is what we, we say, uh, is, um, which is not only for people of the same sex, but for other people too to help themselves among themselves you remember that the he's just talking he's not writing so he sometimes the expressions are imprecise or he leaves the sentence halfway there but anyway he he's going to make it clear um uh, for example, uh, three little old retired women could make a pact amongst themselves only for, let us say, the disposition of their property, who is going to inherit it, and so on, a civil uh, document. Um, uh, but this is not this one. A civil union here, what we're talking about, he says, is much broader. It is a social contract that guarantees in some way civil rights with a certain stability by means of law. It is not a sacrament of marriage. It is not the sacrament of marriage or at least the marriage as what marriage is, that fact. But this um, this the, the went badly in the Episcopal Conference, and that is why the law was approved, I suppose, by the Argentinian government. Perhaps um, uh, marriage of the same sex is, is legal now. I suppose that he's referring to that. Um, that is why the law was approved and passed, because we did not give the government an alternative, really. I think a civil union has to exist. In France, it has been there for a long time. I took it from there. It's a way of giving, of granting a kind of social acceptance. But marriage is something else, has another configuration. But anyway, that is my position. I'm translating it literally, okay? So, um, question. In a recent report by the Associated Association Press Agency, you expressed that homosexuality was not a crime, but yes, it was a sin. What happens then with that sin regarding the possibility of going to hell or to paradise? He dealt with this already in the previous um, uh, section, you remember. 
um, the interviewer goes back to this hell and paradise. He always says paradise, not heaven, but that's okay. Um, and he's bringing him back to that. And he has already spoken, his opinion has already spoke about it. So here he laughs and he says, ah, coming back to what I said earlier about going to heaven and he or hell. I spoke and then he repeats. But instead of skipping it, I'm just going to, to summarize it. He repeats again. <clears throat> I spoke three times about homosexuality, the first on the trip to Rio de Janeiro when I said this sentence, if a person is homosexual and is searching for God, who am I to judge him? A way of saying enough. Secondly, I spoke uh, from when I was coming from Ireland to here, I suppose Rome, the return trip. In the middle of the avian problem, when I said to moms and dads, never throw out of your home a homosexual, a son or a daughter homosexual, accept them. It is your duty as a family. And the third, it was in an interview with the Associated Press when I spoke about criminalization. And in the previous uh, video you will see that he goes on at length talking about this so he's going to say exactly the same thing about 30 countries that hold homosexuality uh, to be a crime and in 10 of them um, it is punished with the death penalty and again he repeats what uh, he had already said my position on homosexuality is based on these three replies here uh, when we have a general audience, uh, sometimes people come who belong to homosexual associations and uh, they are among the people attending there. I say hello to everyone. They are all children of God and each one searches for God and finds him in his own path, however he can. God only distances himself from the arrogant. The rest of all, the rest, all of us, all of us are sinners. We are all in waiting in the queue. We are all in line. <laughs> Question. Holy Father, could you tell me about your stand on voluntary celibacy? Again, he comes back to that point. He has already covered it, but here it is again. Um, he says, the Pope says, it is an open possibility. I don't know if it will be discussed now or not but it is a possibility to be discussed me well in the history of the church there were local concessions on this matter not in the east of course in the eastern church in the orthodox church he has already explained in the previous one that there uh, you can be both married or celibate you have to make the decision as a priest before ordination and he has as I said, already spoken uh, at length in the previous video. Anyway, he goes on. Uh, there might come a time when a Pope m uh, may come to having to deal with this. I still do not find myself now in a position where I have to review it. But it is obviously, it is a question of discipline, not in dogma. We covered that too. Today, it is like this, tomorrow it might not be. Question. What is the preponderance of child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church? Okay, Pope. Well, on that point, I want to be very precise and very objective. First, the percentages we have, more or less, uh, these are global statistics, partly from the United Nations, UNICEF, etc. They seem to uh, state that 40 or 42 percent of abuses of children take, take place in the home, at home and in the surroundings, in the neighborhood. And in this we continue still today in this old way of covering everything up. You know, 
uncles, grandfathers, neighbors, and so on. Then they also, uh, it exists also in team clubs and associations, then in schools, and yes, also we find it in the Catholic Church among priests, which is about, they tell us, 3%. Some say, well, 3% is not much. No, no, no. It is not not much because proportionally Catholic priests are much fewer compared to the others, the rest of the population. So, yes, but 3% of these weigh, they weigh much more than the 40% of the others. Secondly, it is a blasphemy. If you are called to be a priest or a nun, to help this person to seek God, and then you abuse him. You eat him raw. It is horrible, right? Before the Boston scandal, these things were covered up because that was the way of doing things then. And it continues to be to this day within the family, for, for example. It is covered up. And so... This priest in this situation in earlier on was punished or moved to another place. Oh, when the Boston scandal broke broke out, they began the church means began to acknowledge and so the church started saying no, not even one. We are working on this continuously. The complaints are large in number. I like to listen to these cases of sexual abuse when I travel. Well, Pope Benedict started it. He started, uh, and very seriously so. But when I travel, I listen to the people who have been abused. And you can hear absolutely horrible things. And everything was covered up. Total cruelty destruction, destruction. It is a very grave, serious thing. We cannot afford the luxury of covering it up anymore in the church. It has to be uncovered and also in the other places to a prudent extent. We have therefore the work of the commission here and all that. There is a point about child abuse I would like to point out, and it is the problem of, okay, pause, time out here. I have to explain something because of the word that he uses. He's going to talk about pornography, and he's going to talk about pornography with children. I will not say the word because, you know, in YouTube, sometimes you say one word and it triggers a logarithm or whatever it is. And I know it happens to people when discussing um, politics, for example, that sometimes they're quoting someone else, but they deplatform them or they, they cancel them. And then they have to appeal and they have to explain and so on. So there are words that um, I'd rather not say here only to explain one thing. The word that starts with P-E-D-O, yes? And then he makes one whole word out of it and calls it uh, pedopornography. Now, there is a problem here with the auto translation, and that is that word, not as a prefix, but as an just an actual word by itself, nothing to do with children. The word P-E-D-O in Spanish means literally by itself, not to do with children or anything, as I said, by itself, P-E-D-O means F-A-R-T in English. Got me? P-E-D-O means F-A-R-T. So you guessed it. What is going to come up in the auto translation is 
F-A-R-T, pornography. And since he says the word many times, it's going to come up a lot of times. What he's talking about is uh, the pornography of uh, children, um, sexual abuse of children. So he puts it all together. Um, okay, pedopornography. Okay, this is out there. And this pedopornography is done live, live, live. I ask myself, in which country is this kind of pornography being produced? Where does it occur? Where is it being made? Nobody knows. What hidden pacts or agreements are there between certain authorities in this that and the other places and the publishers of this pornography that is being done live live many times with the small very very small children live that is why i am always telling authorities open your eyes look for it find it where is it coming from because unfortunately it is in everyone's hand in your mobile phones in your cell phones this pornography is there in your cell phone oh and the damage it does and it is like a drug you know once you take a liking to it to come out of it oh this I have learned from some addicts when I visit prisons. They went to trial, they were convicted, but you know the biggest effort and the most difficult is the psychiatric treatment to clean them out of this habit of taking it. About pornography I ask, who produces it? Where is it being made? Who covers this production? Who is publishing it? This is a question that must be answered. Question. Holy Father, what is your opinion about the group Maria Colon Zero? Maria Colon Zero. That I suppose is, a, I, I've never heard of it. I suppose it's a group or a movement in Argentina. I don't know that advocates for women to become priests. Pope, this is a theological problem. Not only that, but also the proposal of a female pres priesthood has more than one part to it. In the church, there are two principles. Well, there are three, really, but there are two that are dogmatic. I think it means yes dogma I say this only because he goes on to talk of, uh, about administrative or administrative one is the uh, administrative one if women can be given this or that responsibility etc here we have in the economic council the the there is the a governess out of six laymen five are women so here in the Va in the vatican we have many administrative administrative positions not just of uh, clerical but positions in authority and they are women uh, but the theological principle is a here comes a little problem again he says teleological issue okay there is a difference between the theological and the teleological as you can imagine so i thought that perhaps he just mixed words because they're both so similar but the meaning is different and so i listened to it again and again and I point this out only because in the, okay, in English, theological and th uh, teleological, in Spanish, they're similar. Yeah, you could make a mistake, you know, when talking about it, I suppose. In Spanish, they're quite different. They are t 
theological, theological, and he uses theologal, which is totally different. You know, you can't just sort of mix the words. They're different words. The problem, so I went to, um, I don't know what it was, Google or something, just to make sure about what the difference, how, how the difference is defined properly, not trusting myself in, in my own definition. And it says, okay, theological, uh, the theology, theological is about God or gods or dogma. Teleological is about purpose or design. I've got this from Google, so I, I hope it's correct. That, that was my impression, but I couldn't define it very well myself. Goal directness. Theology is the study of religion, God or gods. A teleo a, a teleological um, theolo uh, moral theory is one that says that there is some goal, that there is a goal and aim towards something. Gives the example of utilitarianism, for example. Uh, utilitarianism, uh, Benjamin uh, Bentham, sorry, the uh, the maxim was the the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Yeah, you remember that. Okay, so it, it, but there is also, for example, a teleological biology is one that thinks each organism of the body has a certain end, and it says Aristotle thought so. So both things could be unrelated. And this is the problem. Because he says this is a teleological issue. That is why I'm confused. But in any case, it could just be a mistake. I don't know. But then he says, for example, oh, and then another confusion. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, I hope I'm not confusing you too with so many confusions. Then he goes on to say, for example, the church, la iglesia, is not male. The church is female. Okay. Um, all of you will, will know. Okay. Spanish being a Latin language is going to have not only the conjugation of verbs, the declination of, uh, the declension of uh, adjectives and so on, but the articles are different. Yes. So uh, words have a grammatical gender. So you have la casa. La is the in the feminine. Uh, el libro, el is the in the masculine. Yeah. This does not make sense in English because we have, we don't have grammatical gender. So we just say the, the house, the book. Okay. So, but he goes on to put this as an example and he says for example the church la iglesia is not male the church is female it is la iglesia not el iglesia it is a woman and it is the bride of jesus christ okay this is all very much together and very sort of mixed together okay let's go back in mystical language in the song of songs for example there is the bride and the bridegroom uh, oh my sister my spouse and so on this the bridegroom st speaks to the bride all right in the church, um, oh, yeah, um, St. John of the Cross, for example, uh, has these wonderful poems uh, where he speaks about the bride and the bridegroom, and the bridegroom is uh, God, and the bride is the soul of man. Um, I remember when I was a child, 
we had to learn one of these poems by heart. I'm pausing here because there is so much confusion. Um, I had to learn one of these poems by St. John of the Cross by, by heart. We had to memorize them. That is how we, it was done in those days. You had to memorize things. And it's this very beautiful poem about the shepherd and the shepherdess. And the shepherd was very much in love with this, this shepherdess. But the shepherdess didn't want to have anything to do with him. He, she was just ignoring it, ignoring him all the time. Didn't want anything to do with him. And so in order to not to even have to see him, she moved to another village. But the shepherd went along and he realized at the end following her and he realizes at the end that she is probably not going to fall in love with him but all he hopes for is that one time just this one please you look at him just once that is all he's asking just gaze at me once and she won't even do that and so that she may see him he climbs to a tree the cross opens his arms in love just hoping 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 against hope that she might just look at him once and waiting and sighing in love he dies for her love yeah, it's, it's a beautiful poem, I tell you. It's, so we had to memorize these things, you know. And the nun would then say, All right, so what is this about? Hands up. It's about a shepherd and a shepherdess. <laughs> yes. And what does it mean? Who is the shepherd and who is the shepherdess? I don't know. God is the shepherd and... The human soul is the shepherdess. And he's talking about how much he loves us, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here he's talking about, he comes back to that of the bridegroom and the bride from the Song of Songs that you can also interpret as God and his church, the bridegroom and the bride, the church, the bride. This is why he's referring to the church is the bride. Okay. But it's all together and he doesn't uh, explain it slowly. So it might sound a little bit odd. Okay. And he says, this is the healthiest theology. The church is a woman. So the church, yeah, the church is a woman but not a minister. You need male ministers. It is a different role. So we have the principle of the ministry and the ecclesial principle. To summarize it, we could go to the Petrine principle from Peter. I'm not sure whether you say Petrine or Petrine, I'm not sure, I'm going to say Petrine principle, which is the disciplinary, the governance, the is the most hierarchical, deacons, priests, bishops, and so on. And then the maternal principle of the church, of care and support and togetherness of the church, which is called the Marian principle. Petrine principle, Marian principle. The church is woman. The Marian principle. Which is more important, this one. A woman is more important in the church than a priest in this Mar Mar Marian principle. Because the Marian principle encompasses everything and touches the femininity of the church. Again, the words are not clear, but 
in terms of hierarchy hierarchy a priest is more important than the woman but because there is a hierarchy of ministry the ministerial line is for men the maternal uh, line that of care uh, women have that theologically speaking if you ask me who is more important Mary or Saint Peter or the Apostles certainly Mary more important because she is the figure meaning the symbol of the church in that line not ministerial of ministry but ecclesial we cannot resolve the issue of women simply in terms of function or functionality no it goes further it goes beyond it is something mystical theological and ecclesial the Petrine principle which is ministry and the Marian principle which is the ecclesiastiology that sustains all everything that is why they see we see some we see them sometimes as he says contradictory but he means in contrast to one another he is imprecise sometimes i'm sorry I'm, i won't say it again <laughs> question in this sense i'm following on this the church of england the anglican church is thinking about removing the words our father in order to remove the gender connotation because it says that god they say that god is neither a man or a woman what do you say to this about this the pope smiles here a little we spoke for a little while on the plane with the archbishop of canterbury when we were coming back from sub sudan i suppose is south sudan sub sudan be careful in the auto translation because it says when we came back from sweating <laughs> i have i have quite <laughs> quite fun looking at these auto translations anyways not from sweating when we were coming back from sub sudan and well it is a small group in the church of england within that line of degendering things without gender well god is father and god is mother the two together it goes beyond but here enter into play that is what is more dangerous still the ideology of gender the ideology of gender is among all ideological colonizations he says that are happening nowadays is in my opinion the worst one because it disempowers it dissembles it takes away the differences and is leading you towards there not being differences when precisely the richest thing is the contrast of differences that brings progress gender ideology is the adjective he uses is nefarious my english ear may not be as well attuned as my spanish ear so i know what it means but i went up and looked for synonymous synonyms sorry of this and he gives us many of the word that he uses in spanish which is nefasta and it can mean several things wicked heinous atrocious appalling abhorrent odious depraved anyway it's quite strong yeah so gender ideology is nefarious not necessarily the people who are in it in into it that is something else but the ideology itself it 
which simplifies, makes one, takes away and removes differences. On this point, I'd like to tell you I once read a book, a book written in 1903. It was a novel by Benson, an Englishman. He wrote it and it is titled The Lord of the World or The Lord of the Earth, something like that. And it looks at the future. Again, auto translation if you're following the interview. Um, it comes up as pain of the world and pain of hearts. Uh, no, uh, but uh, his uh, English pronunciation is, is not very, very good. So they interpret it like this. But it, um, he repeats the title, The Lord of the World or The Lord of earth he wasn't sure and he is describing what is happening today isn't isn't it amazing that taken away doing away with differences uh, it is a novel halfway through it is a little bit boring but it is worth reading because it shows how that look you know the futuristic look a man he was a man who saw makes you aware this uh, strategy or this plot or this tactic of removing differences and making everything uniform, everything, everything, people, everything the same, the same, everything the same. And sameness is the least human thing there is. One of the things that human beings, men, women, that distinguishes one from the other is creativity and liberty or freedom. I can't imagine a dog painting a picture, right? Picasso paints a picture. Why? There is creativity born of freedom. An animal learns discipline of behavior to a point according to how you train it. But creativity is wholly a human thing. That is why we must be careful. And then he gets lost a little bit. He loses his train of thought. You can see in his face that he, he doesn't know why he has just said that. And the interviewer helps him and brings him back. And he says, and creativity is helped by these human differences? Pope, yes, of course, of course. It is encouraged, does not create it, but incentivizes it, yes. For example, in debates, if you take the Summa Theologica, Theologia by St. Thomas Aquinas, when he wants to address a problem, he says, and starts with, it would seem that and then writes all the opinions to the contrary, all the different diverse opinions that others might have. And then he argues out each one of them. It is an intellectual method to, yes, uh, to take a step forward by taking into account at the same time all the questions that are not in agreement with, with you, the ones that may arise. Question, better to be an atheist than a bad Christian, someone said. Is this so? What would you say? And I'm going to leave it there and uh, I will see you tomorrow. I hope this helps. Thank you. Bye-bye.